two, one. Good afternoon, um, everyone, and I just want to say a huge thank you um, and welcome um, for joining us today. Appreciate the position that um, all of you are in as um, busy um, uh, professionals working out in the sector. So I'm hoping um, that you'll find this a, a, a an interesting um, conversation about our new monitoring approach. And of course, we'll have some uh, time for questions later on today. So I'd like to um, introduce you to the team that are supporting this call with me today. So I'm um, Vicky Wells, the Deputy Chief Inspector for Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care, and I lead um, nationally on the regulation um, of the GP sector. Uh, and I've also got a regional responsibility for the regulation of health and care um, across the um, five ICSs um, in London. Uh, I'm also joined by um, Andy Brand, a colleague who is a head of inspection uh, in the east of England um, and is responsible for the regulation of, um, of GPs. And we've got David and Abigail and Steph who are also supporting the call. Um, and helpfully, um, Andy, David um, and Abigail will be monitoring um, questions as we go through. So please do keep the uh, the chat going um, and um, I'll explain shortly how we're going to manage that. So um, as I've said, really hope that you find this useful and productive. We're hoping that um, we will be free of technical glitches. Um, if we have any, um, I'm hoping that Steph will be able to support us with that. Um, but fingers crossed, um, uh, I don't want to speak too soon, but uh, things seem pretty stable this end um, today. Uh, we've got an hour today, so we're, the session runs from one until two um, and we will work. We certainly won't run over uh, past two o'clock um, uh, and we'll do our best to um, give the information out that we need, but also to answer the questions um, that you ask us. Um, the way that this call set up, it's a webinar, so it'll only be the um, webinar team member. So at the moment, only I can speak um, and um, I, I'm able to hand over to members of the CQC team. But engagement with yourselves will need to be through the chat function. But David and Abigail will, as I've said, will be able to manage that. So do please keep the conversation going in the chat. Um, really helpful if you can use your name um, when posting so that so that so that we know um, who, who's asking the questions. Um, today we're talking about the monitoring approach, so we will only be answering questions um, about the monitoring approach, but we do capture any queries and comments and questions uh, that come through. So if there are any themes that are coming through um, around other points that we need to cover, um, we'll, we'll certainly look at these um, after the web webinar is completed and we can come back to you with some further guidance or um, responsive responses if that's going to be helpful. Um, as always, the webinar is recorded um, and it will be uploaded, uh, uploaded onto, um, the, onto our YouTube channel. Uh, so hopefully that means that you'll be able to um, focus on um, what I'm talking through uh, as opposed to scribbling notes um, and you'll also be able to uh, uh, signpost colleagues to this call um, if they've been un unable to attend. Um, we'll also send out slides after this um, event and, and of course we'll send you the link to the um, YouTube channel uh, and any other information that um, we think would be helpful for you or that you request uh, in, the, in the chat function. I can just please go to the next slide, Steph. Thank you. So today we're going to be speaking to you about our new monitoring approach and uh, I'll be talking about how the monitoring approach works, um, and what it means for providers um, across uh, primary medical services. Um, and um, that we will have, 
I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we'll we'll have a good 30 minutes or so for um, questions and answers um, after the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, again, just a reminder to use the um, chat function. So this is about our approach to monitoring during 2021 uh, to 2022. Next slide, please, Steph. So um, some of this um, won't be new for you because since um, the beginning of the pandemic um, and certainly since um, uh, June 2021, we've continued to make progress about monitoring services. So um, uh, you, there will be some language that is familiar to you um, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we had our emergency support framework. Um, and we developed this further to talk about our transitional monitoring approach. Um, and, and we're now move, moving into uh, more of a more of a steady state. Um, and we um, have made some real progress about how we monitor services in, in three key areas. So the three areas that, that I want to talk about, we're developing um, our ability as an organisation to better monitor risk. And what that will do is help us to be much more targeted in our regulatory activity um, as we start to emerge from the pandemic. So our activity is um, likely to be more focused and targeted. Uh, we won't be um, always um, carrying out comprehensive inspections. And in fact, we will only carry out a comprehensive inspection if we need to. Uh, and our monitor activity will be much more targeted. Also for inspection teams, it's really important that they're able to understand all of the information that we hold about services uh, in, in an accessible way. So for inspectors, all of the information about services will be together in one place so that inspectors can uh, really be enabled to make um, decisions based on that information um, in, a, in a better, more timely and more efficient way. And thirdly, um, we're developing elements of how we want to work in the future. And this is about how we can give a more up to date view of risk and quality to people who use services. So a more uh, a real time, um, we want to become a more real time regulator where we're not reliant on a point in time um, inspection um, or a monitor activity. We want to have an understanding um, on a day by day basis around risk and quality and services. Next slide, please, Steph. So um, this is a slide um, that um, you may you may um, want to spend a bit of time uh, having a look through this after the webinar. Um, but this basically um, illustrates how our smart smarter monitoring works. So I'll take us through step by step, and there may be questions. I'm more than happy to answer these um, at the end of the presentation. So um, we'll be carrying out as a regulator monthly reviews of all data and information we hold about all services we regulate. And we'll be doing this to help us to prioritise our activities. At the moment, this excludes our um, dental um, providers and NHS trusts. Um, for um, dental providers, there, there is certainly an ongoing monitoring approach. However, it is um, the same approach that we used during the pandemic, and I can talk through that a little bit um, more um, or I can hand over to Andy to talk about that um, after the presentation, if it would be helpful. And we're working through how we can um, include NHS trusts in this process, so we're likely to see that come on board later this year. So for services where our information review can't find evidence that we need to reassess the rating or quality of the service, we would be publishing a short statement and some providers and um, some of you on this call will already be um, a provider that has a, a short statement published on our website. I'll talk through um, in a few minutes what that statement um, says and what it means. 
But to be clear that this is um, not a ratification of the rating. Um, uh, it, it's really an explanation that we can't find evidence that we need to carry out any further activity. For those services where the information we hold suggests we may need to review the quality of care, we will carry out some further monitoring. And that monitoring is usually in line with the recent um, transitional monitoring approach um, process that we've had um, across uh, primary medical services. So it will usually include a telephone call with the provider. And really the telephone call with the provider is to um, help us to seek assurance that the information we hold um, is fully understood, acknowledged and that the provider's taken the necessary steps to mitigate any risk. So it's, it's um, usually a short conversation with the provider, feedback from providers um, that have been involved in those calls have been positive. Um, that relationship engagement with the um, inspector is really important. Um, and um, a, a short record is made internally um, of those conversations. Um, and we, um, for, for most of those providers, that will be all that's required. There may be some providers that we're not able to um, uh, uh, gain the uh, assurance that we need through that conversation, and we may need to carry out an inspection. So um, if an inspection um, activity is required, the um, provider and the inspector will have some conversation around the inspection and how the inspection needs to be planned. And just to be clear, that we can, um, we will only um, be changing the rating following an inspection. A monitoring review doesn't change the rating of a provider. And what happens? We continue to um, uh, review this process, and this is um, a, a live uh, process with a, a monthly um, refresh. Um, and for providers that receive a statement um, on the website, that will be refreshed each month. So we, we know that our monitoring approach um, has been very successful during the pandemic, and we're continuing to review and improve the whole process to make sure that we're making the right prioritisation decisions. So in doing this, we are carrying out some um, assurance, um, quality assurance activity to make sure that the indicators that we're using to inform this process um, are sufficiently robust. So the information review um, uses a series of rules to determine whether we need to gather more evidence around the quality of care, which is the, the process I've just taken you through. And we do take into account a number of um, a number of different areas, not least the um, services current rating, any ongoing regulatory process, process sorry, processes, um, uh, any data that we hold. So, for example, um, survey data that we may hold, any data that the provider um, submits for us, any information around whistleblowing, um, safeguarding, um, and our own um, information around um, uh, complaints will also be um, considered by the inspector. So these rules um, all, all um, work together to give us a very clear process for determining the priority of activity for particular services. So the, there's, there's quite a lot there um, in that slide. I, I've talk, talked through the process, but um, I appreciate there are likely to be some questions um, uh, and I welcome questions, um, uh, particularly on this slide. Can I have the next slide, please, Steph? So I, um, I talked about a um, public statement um, on our website. So what the public statement does, um, it explains, I'm not going to, um, Actually, I will read out. I will read out the statement. Um, uh, I think it'd be helpful. So the statement says that we carried out a review of the data available uh, to us about the service and the date that we carried out the review. 
and then goes on to say we haven't found evidence that we need to carry out an inspection or reassess our rating at this stage. This could change at any time if we receive new information and we'll continue to monitor data about this service. What's also uh, very important for us as a regulator um, is understanding experiences of people using services. So we also have a link to our give feedback on, on, on the service um, uh, attached to that statement. So if members of the public are interested and um, looking at the ratings um, of the service reading reports, they're easily able to provide feedback um, to CQC on that service. And in addition to the public statement, uh, there is also an email communication um, to the provider on a monthly basis. Um, so uh, many of you on the call, we've got we've got over 800 um, providers on the call. So there'll be many of you that have already um, since July um, received these emails um, and be aware of the statement on the website. The services where we um, carry out the more monitoring activity. So this is called direct monitoring activity. Once we've completed our monitoring activity and we're assured of the quality of care, the service then may be eligible to have the public statement, public statement published on the next monthly review. So if, if a provider has gone through that process of being monitored, and we're assured the uh, provider at the next monthly um, refresh will um, receive an email and a public statement will be on the website. If, um, as will happen um, in a small number of cases, um, we're concerned, um, concerned about the risk um, presented to people using services, um, we will um, uh, progress to um, a, a management review meeting and um, a decision will be made about whether further activity in terms of inspection, focused inspections required. Um, and for um, adult social care and primary care services, if we don't carry out any um, regular, sorry, if we do carry out an inspection, we will send you a copy of the monitoring summar summary record. So again, I, I can I can talk to that more um, uh, during the questions if it's helpful. Next, next slide, please, Steph. So as I've said, um, this has um, been rolled out um, across general practice. We've done a number of communications um, through bulletins um, about this, so I'm hoping that this is a refresh for most of you. Um, uh, particularly those in the central region where we back, where we carried out a pilot, um, uh, which was a successful pilot, um, and we rolled this out nationally um, on the 13th of July. Uh, as I've said earlier, NHS trusts are likely to come into this process over, over the coming few months. Um, and um, it is an interim approach, um, but it is an approach um, that we are um, likely, far more likely to be developing and improving. Uh, we're, we're confident that we're heading in the right direction um, and this will be part of our new regulatory model um, that we will be um, starting to implement from 2022. So um, it, it's, it's quite an exciting time for us as a regulator um, and for providers, uh, particularly for um, our um, primary medical services providers, um, uh, we are hearing that this is a welcome approach because our inspection activity is going to be far more targeted and um, risk based. Um, and uh, for, for the vast majority of our providers, um, uh, that they, they will be part of the um, uh, regular monitoring process as opposed to um, what we the system we had re previously, which was um, based on um, uh, e inspections um, on frequency rules. 
so, so this is part of our new regulatory model and how, how we'll be working in the future. So that's the end of the presentation um, and we can take some um, questions now. I'm, I'm hoping that um, uh, our, our team will help to navigate some of the questions for uh, Andy and myself. Um, if there are questions relating um, to things other than the monitoring approach, we won't cover them here, but as I've said earlier, we're happy to come back to you um, with responses on that. Um, depending on the number of questions that come through, we may not be able to cover them all. If there are themes that come through, um, what we'd like to do uh, is to uh, come back to um, providers with some responses around the themes. So almost like um, a frequently asked questions document um, that, that we can share with all of our GP providers through the bulletin. So um, I'm going to take a break for questions. Um, and after we've um, uh, gone through the questions, what I want to do is to go through um, a slide which um, explains how you can stay up to date um, with uh, CQ's, work, CQC's work and how you can uh, become involved further. So I'm going to um, pause there, Steph, and see how we're going for questions. That's great, thanks. Vicky David here. Uh, we've had lots of great questions in the chat. If we may start with um, how this applies to dental services, there's quite a few questions around that. So perhaps we could talk a bit about the monitoring approach around dental services and any key changes for the dental services uh, in this new strategy. Thanks, um, David. Um, um, Andy, are you able to respond to this one? I am, yes. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so thanks for the question. Yeah, I know that um, in dentistry we're taking a blended approach this year. So there's going to be a, a combination of crossing the threshold and uh, crossing the threshold inspections and calls to providers, which uh, we've used the acronym DMA or direct monitoring approach a couple of times in some of the language that we've used. The direct monitoring approach we tend to use as the, um, the overall uh, approach to monitoring services, but we also carry out a call as part of that process, so a DMA call. You may hear it referred to by inspectors. Um, so the intention for this year is to have, um, well, to move towards a position where we where we just carry out the the call to the practice, moving away from sort of regular uh, crossing the threshold inspections, but have our activity determined by the those DMA calls I was referring to before, of which we anticipate that the proportion will lead to to inspection. Um, we know that we've got nationally something like 4,000 uh, um, services that haven't been inspected for eight or nine years. Um, in terms of the the monitoring approach, we're we're not we're not doing the, um, the the monthly monitoring, which leads to a statement or a banner. We don't do ratings for uh, for oral health, so that that statement wouldn't necessarily work. But the, the kind of monitoring goes on in the background. Um, so we, we use the, the, the intelligence we hold to kind of determine whether we need to inspect or whether we need to carry out a, um, one of those calls. If we receive information of concern in the meantime, then we'll take a view as to whether we inspect or carry out a call. Um, and at the moment, the, the, the inspections that we're carrying out are on practices where we've got outstanding compliance actions from previous inspections, and then we'll, we'll move on to practices where we're getting information of concern and work through them in that order. But a moment, at the moment for this year, it's a blended approach of uh, over the threshold inspections for those practices I've just been talking about, uh, outstanding compliance actions um, and a proportion of uh, monitoring calls just to, de to determine if there's any action that we need to take. So no major changes, I would say, actually, for dentistry. It's mainly in terms of um, uh, GP practices where you see the major changes. Thanks, Andy. Uh, next question. Um, what data exactly is going to be collected this way? And can practices also access the information that is being brought together for inspectors? Uh, it sounds like it will be really valuable. Um, I know you answered this in the chat. Um, but it'd be great uh, for people to hear a bit more about that. Uh, yes, um, so the um, I mean, what will be helpful for providers is um, that we're, we haven't got um, access to a, any um, secret data as a regulator. So all of the data that we use to um, inform 
uh, the prioritisation is data that is available um, to the um, to the practices in terms of performance data. Um, we talked about um, the current rating, any previous breaches, um, uh, whether there is um, uh, uh, any any existing risk so around whistleblowing um, and complaints. So it what the information that we are using isn't any information that's not available to the provider um but it, but it is information that we actually pull together uh, to be able to make an informed decision about the um about the risk and we have um we we have uh, on on the website we have published some information about this um that that I think providers would would find it really helpful and I think think what is also um, really helpful is the information that providers, this doesn't replace the interaction with the inspector. So it's really important that providers and inspectors continue to have that engagement relationship because providers will also have information that they want to share with their inspectors. So if they've, um, for example, carried out um, uh, a patient survey themselves or have um, undertaken some um, particular audit activity, etc. It's really important that, um, that, that providers um, do, do keep inspectors updated with this. And following on from that, a few people have asked, um, will providers be able to review the information centrally held by the CQC? Uh, and what opportunity does providers have to check that the information that the CQC held is is accurate? Yeah, um, so I, I'm hoping that the uh, the way I responded to the first question um, reassures providers that that this isn't necessarily information that providers don't have um, access to, David. Um, if providers are concerned about this, they can certainly have um, uh, make, make contact with us um, as, a, as a regulator. If they're concerned that, um, that the way that we are making decisions um, uh, it isn't um, in accordance with their, their own sort of thinking and information they hold, um, you know, we would welcome that conversation. OK, great. Thank you, Vicky. Um, a few questions about um, how can providers improve their rating um, if they're not in inspected? So, for example, to go from good to outstanding, if they're not going to be uh, inspected, how would a provider go about improving their rating? Yeah, re really good question, and, um, and I'm glad it's been asked. And I'm, if it's been asked several times, I'm I'm, I'm even more pleased about it. Um, during the pandemic, we have been largely focused on on risk, um, and uh, providers will know that we um, we have been in inspecting um, when we need to inspect um, in response to risk. However, um, for the future, we know that it's really important that we identify improvements. In particular, we want to um, be able to continue to see um, and report on and share outstanding practice. So we are doing some work internally about the, um, the best way to do this. Uh, so recognising improvement and um, innovation in, in primary care is really important for us as a regulator and disseminating that information. So we'll be able to share more about this with you um, in, in the future. This, this model um, at the moment um, will help us to understand uh, inspectors will still be able to see if there is an improving trajectory um, in the information we hold. So. Um, in theory, an inspection could be triggered um, at that review stage for, for, um, uh, for a provider that it looks that they're improving from good to outstanding. So we will be able to see that trajectory and trigger inspection activity. Uh, however, we are also mindful of balancing uh, the impact of any additional inspection activity on providers at the moment. So it will be very much around a conversation with the provider. But really, David, it's it's one of the um, one of the most important things for us um, at the moment as we sort of uh, uh, 
move out of the pandemic and away from the um, responding to risk um, because we know that the way uh, providers improve is to um, showcase and um, uh, really share the um, innovations and good practice across primary care. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a good question here that says, what steps are taken to mitigate the impact on clinicians' mental health of an ongoing monitoring in this way? So, for example, instead of, you know, being informed when you're going to have an inspection and then you build up to the inspection, if the inspection and the monitoring is ongoing, what, um, what uh, has been put in place to mitigate the impact on a clinician's mental health? Yeah. Um... I think what I'd like to say is that our inspectors have always um, monitored um, services um, in an ongoing way. Um, our inspect, but we haven't had the system for um, recording it um, in the way that we have now. So for for inspectors, um, th this isn't. Um, it's not particularly novel. Um, inspectors have had relationships and have always monitored, monitored information that we receive. Um, I think the question is around possibly, uh, uh, it's a difficult one without understanding a bit more around it, but I think the question may be more about is, is there an anxiety here that at any time an inspection could be triggered um, as opposed to the previous um, uh, regime where we, uh, so providers uh, knew that if they were rated good that they would not get an inspection um, unless there were any concerns um, for a three year period. So there was that period of time when maybe providers didn't feel um, as close to the regulator. Um, I think that's probably what the question is about. Really, really it's a really difficult one. And um, for whoever's um, asked the question, I'm more than happy to, to have a one to one conversation sort of separately, um, if that's helpful. Um, but really, really to say that this, this is not a significant change for inspectors in the way that they've had that ongoing uh, monitoring um, uh, relationship with providers. So David, I feel like I've, I'm hoping that I've given sort of a bit of my understanding of what's behind the question, um, but there may be some chat that I've got that totally wrong and I'm, I'm happy for you, to, uh, you know, to come back to me on it if there's more chat. Great, thank you, Vicky. We're still getting some questions through from quite a few people not being completely clear on what exactly is being monitored and on what data is being gathered. Uh, perhaps we could just outline that ag again in a bit, a bit of detail as we're still getting some questions through about that. Um, David, are the questions um, more specific or did you want me to repeat? They're just, they're just very general. I'm, I'm still unclear what data the CQC is gathering for monthly assessments. Um, I'm not clear on what is being monitored and how. Um, please, can you clarify where your data is drawn on a monthly basis? We're still getting those questions in now, even after you've explained. So perhaps we could just say a few more words on that. OK, so um, so I, I've talked about um, uh, the uh, current the current rating. Um, so um, the current um, CQC rating, um, uh, any um, breaches, um, uh, open breaches, so providers that are rated um, good that may still have breaches. Um, we look at whether a registered manager is in place. I have to say that for uh, primary medical services, um, that's less of, um, less of a risk. I mean, adult social care services, um, not having a registered manager um, ca can be more of a risk. Uh, we look at um, the time since the last um, inspection um, and um, any registration activity. So that have there been any changes to the registration? Um, are there any safeguarding concerns? Um, 
what the themes are around the safeguarding concerns, any whistleblowing, any complaints or concerns that CQC have received. Um, we look at um, prescribing um, indicators, um, disease management indicators, uh, patient experiences, uh, we look at access data. So uh, David, I don't know, I'm hoping that that gives a little bit more. We can put, um, David, we can put, we can share the link to the website which has got a bit more information on um, for people. I think that'd be helpful. Yes, I would think that'd be, that'd be very good. Thank you, Vicky. Are there any instances when a, an inspection would automatically be given, et cetera, moving premises? Um, no, uh, so I mean, moving premises is an interesting one. Um, we, when, a, when there is a new registration, um, we have all, we have um, had in place a um, a rule that we will inspect within a year of the registration. So at the moment um, that has um, that is still in place. However, for the future, we'll we'll very much be taking um, into account all of the information that I've just talked about. So a new registration won't necessarily mean an inspection within the year. A change of premises is, is an is an interesting one because uh, that may or may not be. Um, it, it depends really on the legal entity and and uh, what the implications are for registration. David, we will. We will. I, I think what what's probably easier to say is that we when we inspect, we will always inspect for a um, specific reason. We will not be uh, carrying out routine inspections. OK, thank you very much. There's a few questions on patient feedback. Uh, so, for example, is there a way that providers can upload their own captured patient feedback to be taken into consideration? And secondly, um, when you, you talked earlier about complaints uh, and some some people are asking, you know, where do those complaints come from? And uh, is there any way that they can see those complaints as, as well? Um, so I think that, so there's two there's I think there's two two separate points there, um, David. Um, so the um, patient feedback that provide their own patient feedback. Yes, they can share that with CQC. How easy is it to do at the moment? I think it could be easier. Uh, in the future, um, we are developing um, a provider portal, so it will be much easier for providers to sort of real time be able to share information with us. At the moment, it's reliant on the provider and the um, inspector um, engagement and the provider submitting that information separately. But certainly um, we are very interested in that information that providers hold. It's, it's really important that we have that um, relationship without being too um, uh, burdensome on the provider needing to send everything into us. So yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, we don't always make it easy, um, but we will be making it easier in the future. Uh, sorry, what was the second point was around complaint. Yes, how how does the CQC receive complaints and is there any way that providers can view those complaints that the CQC has received? Um, Andy, shall, shall I hand this to you? Um, I, I'm just mindful, Andy, that I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> Um, well, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, so um, complaints wise, you may be aware that CQC, we don't have a, a remit to investigate individual complaints. So um, if, if if a member of the public comes to us and say, you know, I can't get an appointment, then, um, you know, we will always refer them back to the practice for to use the practice's internal complaints mechanisms. And then if they don't get a satisfaction or if they're not satisfied with their response, then they can go to uh, the ombudsman, as is the, the kind of normal procedure. So the first thing to say is we don't investigate individual complaints, but we may look for patterns and themes and we may look for how practices have, have, practices have responded to complaints. So we don't routinely share the information we get from the public 
uh, with a practice, but what we may do as part of our monitoring activity, the inspector is more likely to actually contact the practice and just say, we're getting a, a couple of complaints about this. We seem to have a, a bit of a theme going on. Um, is there anything you want to tell us about it? Is there anything, you know, is there anything you can think of that would, might um, explain why why we're getting these things? And sometimes it's it's something that, um, you know, it, it's, it's easily answered. It's not necessarily something that we would need to go and take regulatory action about. Um, and also, uh, it's more likely to end up as opposed, you know, it, it wouldn't, it'd be very unlikely for a complaint to come in and trigger an inspection straight away. The, the chances are that the inspector would make contact with the practice either through a phone call or through one of these structured um, monitoring calls to get a bit more information before we, before we draw any conclusions. So I hope, hopefully that kind of reassures you a bit about the complaints and, and, what, and what we do with them. Thank you, Andy. Um, a question about the, the pandemic now. Uh, the pandemic is likely to have skewed a lot of data over the past 18 months. How are the CQC taking this into consideration to ensure practice data is not portraying inaccurate picture or being compared to previous years as it will not be comparable? Okay, so I'll I'm, I'll start this off, but I'm going to hand Andy to you because I know Andy, you've been doing a lot of work around this, and um, uh, Andy was involved in um, uh, briefing um, our inspectors actually about this um, recently. Uh, so we absolutely um, take that on board. Um, it's um, it's been really important for us to be able to understand um, what's been happening and the pattern, um, the patterns that we're seeing around data. And we acknowledge that as a regulator that um, the information um, that we're going to see, the data that we're going to see, uh, certainly over the next 18 months, probably, um, probably longer than that, um, isn't going to be um, as helpful um, as it has been previously. And there is a need for us as a regulator to be able to be um, absolutely clear um, around how we, um, uh, what, what we do to mitigate the risk around that, um, which includes obviously um, capturing other information um, in order to co uh, corroborate um, the, the data. But Andy, I'm going to hand, hand it because I think you can be a bit more specific, Andy, about the sort of messages that we've given to inspectors around this and the actions we've taken. Yeah, so um, in terms in terms of data, you may be aware that we are um, we're going to stop using QOF data, specifically QOF data um, from the 1st of October. Um, the reason being is that uh, it has, as you say, been skewed. Um, by the pandemic and we're going to we're going to cease using it for at least 12 months and then review what we do with it after that. So the quaff data is going, a lot of those measures have been placed into income protection anyway. And it was always um, we used quaff because it was the best information we had at the time to, to gain a, a, a sense of how practice were performing and also to use it were they using quaff as a um, uh, improvement tool, tool to drive improvement. Um, so we're not going to be using that anymore because it's not reliable and we're replacing QOF in terms of long term conditions with some additional searches which will be run by our clinicians um, on practice clinical systems remote uh, from a distance with their with their permission. So there's a set of uh, additional searches which have been devised. Um, and actually we feel this is probably better because it's bang up to date information as opposed to QOF, which is, you know, uh, many months many months out of date so uh, that's what we're doing in terms of um, that data in particular uh, you may also be aware that we are no longer rating in terms of population groups um, so we're, we're taking the effective key question and the responsive key question as a whole as opposed to dividing up into population groups so also that means that you won't have um, practices being skewed because the, there's this data looks um, there's strong data in one particular population group or two population groups, which then got um, amalgamated into an overall rating. So now we're taking the, the overall rating for uh, the key question like effective um, based on 
the evidence as a whole as opposed to specific population groups and potentially skewed data. Um, <clears throat> so it also means that we'll be taking into, into account the context that the practice is in. So in, including the demographic, do they have a higher proportion of older people? What's the disease prevalence like? I've got a lot of uh, younger patients at childhood IMS more important than maybe another practice. So I can see some questions coming in before about context. So hopefully that will kind of reassure in that direction as well. So key messages there, uh, we're, we're no longer using COF from the 1st of October and we're, we're not rating the population groups from the 1st of October either. Uh, thank you, Andy and, and Vicky. Um, there's a few questions coming in um, about the notice period for inspection. So when there will be a physical inspection, will the notice period still be two weeks or has that changed as well? That that has that hasn't changed, David. OK, good. A nice short, a nice short one there. Um, will a provider's local inspector still liaise with the registered manager of each service? Um, as, as the relationship owner, David, yes. Um, there may be a, if there is um, monitoring activity, there may be somebody else in the team um, that carries out the, um, uh, the monitoring conversation. Um, at the moment, as it stands today, it is the um, relationship owner and the lead inspector that would usually do that. Um, but we are doing some work around how we can manage our resources in this area. And um, but we will keep um, providers up to date with that. But but the important thing is that there will. Providers will all continue to have their own um, relationship with with an inspector. If any other inspectors are involved um, in any of the um, activities um, within CQC that close um, communication relationship it is very, very important, but they will still have a lead inspector. Wonderful, thank you. And I think we're coming to, to the end of the questions now. Uh, I think we've managed to get through a lot of the, the main subjects and topics that have been asked. Um, I'll just have another a scroll through with my colleague now to pick out any that we might have missed. So just give us one minute. Um, David, um, if it's helpful while you're scrolling through, there are some that I could probably give a very quick answer to. Um, do you want me to do that, David? Certainly, if you've seen some in there, you can give a quick uh, answer to. Please yeah, do. I'm, I'm sort of stepping out of my space into your space, but um, I, I, I can see some. So let's let me just see. Um, there's a question around um, publishing criteria for searches. Um, Andy, can you answer that? The long term condition searches. Um, Andy, will we be publishing those? I've, yeah, we have got, um, I'll put it into the, the chat before about Mythbuster 12. So if you look on the CQC website um, and look under the, if you put Mythbusters into the search uh, bar there, um, there's a set of Mythbusters by key question which comes up. And if you look for GP Mythbuster 12, that lists the searches that we do. We will be updating that with the um, the new uh, the, those additional five searches that we're adding for uh, the long term conditions. It will be it will be updated. If you give me a second, I'll just I'll actually find those searches and drop them into the chat as well. Just a, an overview of what they are, just to help. Thanks, Andy. Um, uh, question here: Change of statement of purpose will it trigger an inspection? Uh, no, um, not necessarily, and probably highly unlikely. Um, it does depend what the change is, but um, no, no, it shouldn't. Um, for, for, on, on most most instances, it, it wouldn't. We've got quite a few questions around searches. Um, I think, and it might be helpful, um, uh, and it would be good to um, hear from people whether it would be helpful for us to run one of these sessions. Um, for people interested in clinical searches, um, Andy, we could take that away if people, if we can have a, a quick, if people can um, say if they, they'd find that helpful, we can do that. Quite a few questions around searches. And uh, when, when will GP practices expect to start to receive monthly statements? Will they, they be no? 
They should be receiving them now, David. If if a practice hasn't received a statement, it's because um, they will be in that monitor process, David. OK, wonderful, thank you. Uh, and another one says, will there be maximum times between inspections? But I think you, you've outlined this before that that's, no. that's not the process anymore. No, it's not. No, the um, frequency rules no longer exist. OK, I am I am just going to. Um, I'm going to wrap up uh, time scale around the provider portal. Um, we haven't got a time scale um, on that. Um, uh, but um, we will be able to come back to you more on when that will have an impact um, on, on um, PMS providers. OK, that's great. I think that's all the main questions yeah. for now. Thank you. But, OK, so um, Steph, if you can. Oh, thank you. So um, this really is, is a slide um, uh, that I, I'd like you to um, take a look at um, and share it with colleagues. It's about how you can stay up to date. Um, so we've got um, an excellent um, digital platform. Um, and if you sign up to that, um, you really do um, have the opportunity to keep very close to all of the work um, that we do in CQC, um, in particular around um, uh, primary medical services. So um, please do sign up to that. We also, um, hopefully you're signed up to um, our bulletins anyway. And that, um, all um, blogs um, can be found and you, you can go back to look at the to look at the blogs. We've got a Twitter account um, which, which is quite active. Um, and we've also um, we've got CQC Connect where you can listen to um, uh, the, the latest podcasts. Uh, so some some really, uh, really, really good ways to stay up to date. We, we hear from providers and especially um, during the pandemic, how difficult it is to read every email that comes through um, and uh, you know listen to every podcast, uh, read every bulletin. So we're re working really hard on the provider bulletin um, to make it clear um, which are the which are the um, areas that are real uh, must reads. Um, and which are, are those um, that are that are, are nice to read and not of interest, but can wait. So um, any feedback on the provider bulletin um, would, would be helpful. Um, uh, I know there's often a lot of information in there, so we will uh, continue to hopefully improve and flag for your attention the things that really uh, require um, immediate. Im immediate review and the things that that, that you know, you can kind of um, add uh, on, on your to read or to do list. Uh, so I'm going to um, close um, close the webinar um, now, unless there is anything housekeeping wise I've missed um, or that anyone else um, on the CQC team wants to add. Just that there's lots of lots of yeses in the chat for some more information on searches. OK, and just to add that I've put the um, I've dropped a, a very brief summary of those additional searches into the chat as well. That's great, yeah, um, and we will we will definitely um, Andy will take will take that away and, and do something on the clinical searches um, sim similar to how we've led this call. OK, so um, a really big thank you, um, as I said, um, earlier on, really appreciate um, you know the challenges that you that you uh, that the sectors are under um, in primary care, uh, well across the whole of um, health and care. Uh, so to take um, an hour out of your time, I um, you know re we really appreciate it from CQC. I hope you find it uh, found it helpful, um, and um, you know please do um, share with colleagues uh, the recording if you think that they'd find it helpful. 
Uh, I just want to check um, from Andy. Is there anything, Andy, that you want to say? No, just thanks to everybody for joining, turning up and participating. Really appreciate it. Great, thank you. Uh, anything from any of the CQC colleagues? No, all good. Fantastic. OK, big thank you to everyone um, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye.